And I think the companies that will do well are companies or SaaS companies that are a system of record that have enough data within their product set, either from a product standpoint from a user, or from a user standpoint, and utilize that data and make the experience better. So those are the companies that's going to do well. The companies that might struggle or even become obsolete are ones that don't have like data. Like it's not a system of record, it's maybe a system of engagement, but I think those will be challenging, right? Hi folks, welcome back to another episode of On Call with Insignia, where we go on call with leaders innovating the future of emerging markets around the world. And for this episode, we actually have a very special guest. It's our first guest from Japan. In recent years, we've been, at Insignia Ventures, we've been very interested in Japan, not just for potential investments, but also since many of our companies have been expanding to that market. So really an important time to actually learn more about that market. And we have no one better than one of the thought leaders in that market. And I'll have our my co-host, England, introduce him. England? It's a pleasure today with a special treat, Mr. Asada-san, Shinji Asada, who has become a good friend and also a co-investor and a good partner for us in Japan. He is a veteran in the venture capital space in, in Japan. I, and I would say definitely one of the top venture capitalists. I learned a lot from him. And I think we, he can share a lot on the landscape in Japan. And I just want to keep these things off with your decades of experience in investing and building software companies across Japan and US. I'd love for you to introduce yourself and say a little bit about your background and also share a little bit about one or two pivotal moments in your career as you develop as a partner, a great partner for Japanese entrepreneurs. Yeah, sure. I appreciate it. Just a quick background about myself. I started my career at a company called Itochu Corporation. It's one of the biggest trading companies here in Japan. Recently, Warren Buffett, I think, invested a lot. So there's been a lot of press around trading companies. And within that company, I was doing investments into U.S. companies and helping them come to Japan. That was my primary goal. And then I was also seconded to a subsidiary called the Tochu Technology Ventures, which is a corporate VC arm that does mainly early stage investments in Japan. And that's when I fell in love with investing. And I met a company called Merkari, which became the biggest tech IPO in Japan history. And I realized great companies are founded with great products, period, right? If it's not a great product, you have a great founder with a great background. It doesn't really mean anything. So product was what really realized that great companies are built. And then I went on to Salesforce to become the Japan head. It was probably early days of SaaS in Japan, 2015. Some people in Japan were calling it ASP, not SaaS. It means the same thing, but it was called differently. And I was like tweeting like all day about SaaS. And I think the timing was right. Many companies were founded around 2012 and 2015, went on to become billion dollar companies. And those were company names of Sansan, Free, Visional. And Yingling, I'm sure you've met some of these founders. And back in the days that he told you, I was using internal software built by a system integrator in Japan of the likes of Fujitsu, NEC, and Hitachi. And I don't want to be sounding a little bit rude, but it wasn't an easy software to actually use. Expense management was a nightmare. I had to log in with a VPN sometimes when I was out of the office. Even if you clicked on the forgot password link, it, you wouldn't get an automatic email reply. It would have to be overnight or the next day or something. So all around, it was a bad experience using enterprise software. But starting from like 2015-ish, there was a lot of modern software, SaaS software, and the business model catered towards customers, right? Because if the customers were angry at the user interface or user experience, they would just cut it off and turn off and turn on, turn it to another SaaS offering, right? As Salesforce Ventures, I learned a ton because Salesforce is the biggest SaaS company in the world. And I was a part of a small team, but grew to probably about 20 people globally. I wanted to also go back to the time where you thought about starting One Capital, which has now developed into one of the preeminent new age and best in class Japan focused SaaS funds. Actually, globally, I think globally, you're probably one of the top SaaS funds as well. So I wanted to go back and see what was the thinking behind starting the firm and yeah. your background from Itochu and Salesforce Ventures. Several things. One, from the market perspective, Japan's SaaS penetration rate back at 2015 was probably less than 1%, but it was growing pretty fast. And 
even today, still only accounts for about 4% of the enterprise IT spend within Japan. So there's a lot of room to grow. That's one. The second part is that I was growing older. I was in my early 40s and the founders that I backed back at Salesforce, they were like, Shinji, uh, when are you starting to own your own fund? You've been with the corporate for like over a decade, right? Why don't you start your own stuff? So I got a nudge from them. And thirdly, several experiences at Salesforce Ventures was a big lesson for me in the sense that it was a corporate VC and an amazing one. But during that time, I had some issues doing follow-ons, even for the companies that, that was really performing and winning because it was a strategic investment. And when you strike the partnership initially with the initial check, you didn't really have to do a second fund check or an investment to solidify the partnership. We were trying to add more companies to the portfolio base and problems were a little bit difficult. And I wasn't really being totally supportive for the entrepreneur, right? Because if the companies were performing, existing companies with investors would just follow on, right? And I wasn't able to do that. So that was also a big moment for me. And with that, big market, emerging market. I had entrepreneurs that was like, we'll back you with your first fund. And thirdly, I wanted to be a true partner for my entrepreneurs and make my own decisions and make my own risks. And that's how I formed One Capital. That's great. And t tell us a little bit about, I thought one of the very interesting things about uh, One Capital was the digital transform in, transformation initiatives. Can you tell a little bit more about this? Yeah. So our mission is to transform Japan and make it faster. And in order to do this, I think using the fund vehicle would be an effective method, right? And we have two large uh, anchor LPs. One is called Aza. It's a pharma company. And my co-founder is a Boston consulting guy. And he has been transforming companies for decades, right? But he felt there was a challenge with the consulting model where you are contracted about three to six months or an extension of about 12 months in trying to transform a company. We wanted to utilize the fund model where you have an LP that invests in your fund for about 10 years, right? 10 plus two years. And you have a lot of runway to actually help them transform. So with that angle, you know, the large companies in Japan are actually commanding a lot within the Japanese ecosystem from an economy perspective. So if you were able to turn these companies into strong software companies, that would be an angle to transform Japan. And the other one is our main business is the fund investments. Invest in the next sales force in Japan and have them be installed in literally all the companies in Japan and fast track all of them. That's great. I want to double click on this. So what do you mean to say is actually other than being LPs, do you do joint ventures with them? Do you do spin outs or do you insert startups into these companies? as customers, it probably varies, but I'd love for you to elaborate a little bit more. Yeah, there are several ways to digitize a company and one is for them to install digital products within their firm internally. And our anchor LPs are actively looking at our portfolio companies and adopting those services to become more competitive in their respective markets. So that's one. The second is to really sit down with them and help them put together a roadmap about how to become a digital company, like how Netflix became a DVD rental business to a net, to a streaming service, right? But mainly what we actually do is heavy consulting and also introduce our portfolio companies to them. Fantastic. And I wanted to jump to another interesting innovation that One, One Capital has done, which is projection.ai, which is a very interesting platform that you should share with the audience. I wanted to also see what's the biggest learning from the ex experience of putting this platform together and some of the interesting insights that you have gleaned. And I've personally seen the demo. It's very impressive. I would urge all the listeners to, to check it out. But uh, yeah, Masada san please tell us more. Yeah. So the thinking behind that was I'm a software investor, right? But I've never built the software myself. And I thought in order to be better at investing, getting a better understanding of how to build software would escalate my ability to become a better investor, right? And also have stronger empathy towards founders. And of course, I read a ton of coaching books. I took coaching lessons and I try and always be empathetical. But at the same time, if you don't have that experience, it's really hard to emulate those kinds of characteristics. So that's one. And secondly, I wanted to build software that was relevant to VC. And I think 
there's several aspects to that. One, you need data. And especially enterprise software, there's a lot of data around. And I really admire the reports that Bessemer actually publishes. And they have this Bessemer Cloud Index. So we, we have a same version of Japan called One Capital Cloud Index. And starting off from there, we're like, why don't we put, a, put together a database just for SaaS public companies? And also, the database is evolving to capture private SaaS companies' data. And why don't we publish this on the web? And that would also benefit the SaaS ecosystem, but also our founders that we backed. Because these founders that we backed are building products every single day and talking with customers. And they don't really have time to log on to Bloomberg, right? Every single second. But Bloomberg is an amazing database, but it doesn't really cover just SaaS. It covers everything, right? So we wanted to build this uh, database that was just focused on SaaS. And I guess you took a look at it and happy that you like it. That's fantastic. I think you, you're very humble, but I would say one of the most impressive software platform that you built, especially comprehensive Japanese data. So I want to also now turn back to your investing in one capital. What would you say is your most impactful or a, a, a investment that you feel the most proud of? Either one capital or be prior to that. Tell us the story of how you met the founders and the uh, biggest challenge through the partnership. Yeah, so our One Capital is pretty new. So we've got interesting companies in our portfolio. And those are like Ovis, Healthfield, and Knowledge Work. And we've got a bunch of them, which is emerging. They're still in the early stages, but and becoming middle to late stage companies right now. The company that I would raise from an impactful perspective that's already gone public is a company called Visionow. And Yingling, I think you went to see the World Cup soccer with him or something. Yeah, that's right. Minami said. <laughs> My first interaction was when he was like just after he graduated from the building the Rock Dam baseball team. And he was thinking about starting a company and he was thinking about maybe switching to a company. So he wasn't really sure. But when he shared with me the deck of Biz, BizReach, the matching platform, I was blown away. I wasn't a VC then. I was trying to back him through my entity at Itochu. It wasn't successful. And I regret that <laughs> since that day. And I've been a close friend and had a relationship after that in, in initial discussion. And then I went on to become the Japan head of Salesforce and then I backed him there. And it's a very unique company where he raised a little, just a small amount of money built a business, sold it, and used that as fresh cash to fund his business matching platform. And Salesforce was a Series A investor, which, but I think the round was about 50 million of rays, which is like gigantic from Japan standards. And now he is a public company worth close to 3 billion in market cap. Well, that's a great story. And I also see, see his journey and you know, I, I hear all the great stories that he tells me about you and you have been a great business partner for him. That's great. I think recently we have been very interested in Japan. We have made investments. We have a co-investor with you in Notch. We actually just announced a new one called Bluemo in the investment space. And I, you are the grandmaster of Japan investing. What are the advantages of building a tech company in Japan versus other markets? If you, I think some of our listeners may not be that familiar with the market. And what can entrepreneurs in Southeast Asia or elsewhere learn from the entrepreneurs we have partnered with and vice versa? See, it probably is a hard market to crack because of the language barrier and the cultural barrier. But at the same time, it's a big market. It's the third largest economy in the world. But especially around enterprise software, it is the second largest market after the United States. Let me give you some figures. It's about 280 billion on an annual spend basis, on an annual spend basis. And a lot of that is dominated by on-prem legacy software that I just mentioned about when I was using it at Itochu. So it's a low hanging fruit. If you have a great user interface experience, you can land customers. The initial leeway should start with SMBs and then move it up to mid-market and enterprise, but it's a very low hanging fruit market. And I think APIR that you backed when you were at Sequoia, they entered Japan with a great product. I think they got huge enterprise customers like CyberAgent and they were, they went public. So 
if you are able to crack the market from a language and a cultural perspective, you will do well in Japan. That's great. You'll be the first part of call, the grandmaster to learn from. And I think you mentioned, I think the IPO story, which IPO on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. In addition, we also see a number of our portfolio companies like Caro and Intellect expand to Japan. What advice do you have for founders A, looking to expand to Japan and also considering going public on the Tokyo Stock Exchange? Because I think one of the interesting things about Tokyo Stock Exchange is actually you, compared to NYIC or NASDAQ, you actually can go public at a fairly early stage in the company's life cycle. Of course, I think there are some best practices that you do have Japanese customers, but you will be the expert to, to share. Yep. So you're definitely right. Some U.S. investors call the growth market in Japan, the public growth market in Japan as a series B round. <laughs> a typical company that goes public does about 10 million of AR, but it's also profitable about a million dollars of net profit, meaning slower growth in smaller companies. At the same time, the history tells us that you can go public earlier, but your market cap is not going to grow as fast because you're not spending enough cash to grow your business, right? There's pros and cons to everything. So that's how I feel. And to answer your first question about Japan entry, I think you should really hire a strong country manager that isn't purely about his or her bilingual abilities. Maybe the person, you know, might not have an Harvard Business School degree or something, the guy that can, the guy or gal that can actually execute is what I would really recommend. And it's, but it is challenging to be communicating with a local Japan head that doesn't speak full in English, but like at the same time, we got all kinds of tools out there, right? Like Google Translate and all that stuff. So I think you should really focus on execution versus the ability to purely communicate. I also wanted to get you to give a landscape for our limited partners in the audience where we have quite a couple of listeners. Japan is a relatively new market to them. I don't think and endowment funds, institutional investors. I think some have been in Japan, but it's relatively new for the venture landscape. How do you articulate the opportunity set in, in, in Japan venture capital for someone who has not looked at the market before? Yeah. So Japan's 22 venture capital market was around 10 billion. Right. And the government is emphasizing that they want to 10x that by 27, 2027 to 100 billion. So there's going to be a lot of cash that is going to be put into the market, which is a good thing all around because the economy size is big enough, but the innovation part is lacking. So why not put in more venture capital money? And the government is supportive and the multiples, which is extremely important for investors is down and is to in the US market, like a SaaS company multiple would be trading around like 15 to 20 X, probably in 2021 figures. Now it's trading around five to X, five to six X. So I think it's great timing to take a look at Japan from an LP standpoint and start at the low point of the market, because if you are starting from the high point of the market and expecting it to go higher, that's a difficult sell, right? That's great. And I would say the, the prior conception for Japanese founders is there aren't many. It's, they stay in a job for one, one the, their whole career. But I think it's starting to change. And I don't think people recognize that. Maybe you want to share a little bit about the transition of the Japanese entrepreneurial pool. Yep. So I was probably a typical Japanese guy that wanted to work at Itochu for life. I was there for 15 years and... It wasn't a casual decision for me to leave it. It was a great company. It was like a family culture. There's two types of entrepreneurs that I'm looking at, right? One, the ones that are early members of public companies right now, like Samsung, Visional, and Free. Those members have really been the catalyst of growing the companies from the ground up, and they are starting their own companies. Right. The second one are people that worked at companies like Itochu or Mitsui or any big company in Japan and transferred to a tech company here like Google, Facebook, Salesforce. Those members are also great, you know, potential entrepreneurs for us to back. And when you even talk to the younger generation, they have their own sophisticated career map, right? Start with a big Japanese company or US tech company. Be there for three or four years, experience it, go to a startup, 
build a business, and then start, right? Because as I mentioned, if the government is really trying to push forward entrepreneurship, there's a lot of capital there. And then the cultural norm that you can't make mistakes in Japan is probably going to change. That's great. I wanted to say a little bit about the current economy, which is obviously going through un uncertain times. What is your advice to founders, especially SaaS founders, navigating sales and monetization? Also in an environment where there's tight spending and cost cutting. Yeah, totally. I think the straightforward answer is burn multiple, right? It used to just be growth, right? And in SaaS, if you grew triple, triple, double, you would be awarded a term sheet, right? From 10 different SaaS investors, right? But you also have to look at burn multiples, right? Even at, if you're sacrificing a little bit of growth, I think burn multiple is how you should play the game. And David Sachs, the famous SaaS investor in the US, wrote a famous blog about burn multiple. If you're about 1x, you're a great company. If you're a 2x, that's so-so. If you're a 3x, that's a bad growth rate. So I have been really commanding this within my portfolio companies and they are in the ranges of 1x to 2x per multiple. And congrats to the entrepreneurs that actually executed this. And with a stronger market and a robust financial market, they would be awarded a term sheet with favorable terms. But if you are burning money too much and saying that you're growing, your Indian economics doesn't make sense. That's not a good business to be in. Burn multiple is my straightforward answer. That's great. And I also want to touch on the topic that's quite hot recently, generative AI, GPT-4. How are you seeing this impact the way new generations of companies are, are, are growing? I think it's a huge threat and also a, a huge potential. It's nothing in between. It's interesting that Sam Altman came to Japan and met the Prime Minister Kishida-san at an earlier timing, right? Because there are some countries that are banning OpenAI and ChatGPT, right? But generically, Japan is taking that huge innovation in a positive way to try and transform Japan. So for SaaS entrepreneurs, you should obviously embrace it and connect to their API or build something related to them and supercharge your service. And I think the companies that will do well are companies or SaaS companies that are a system of record that have enough data within their product set, either from a product standpoint from a user, or from a user standpoint, and utilize that data and make the experience better. So those are the companies that's going to do well. The companies that might struggle or even become obsolete are ones that don't have like data. Like it's not a system of record, maybe a system of engagement, but I think those will be challenging, right? Like even for an amazing company like Zoom, I'm sure there's a lot of recorded data on their archives, but I think it's just for an archive not being really utilized. And if they do R&D there, maybe they will be supercharged, but if they don't, since it's not a system of record, it might be replaced by another party, right? That's great. We have a segment called the Minute Masterclass, where, you know, if you were to give a masterclass on growth for SaaS companies to founders, what would be one of the key lessons on benchmarking and leveraging industry data that you want your founders to take away? And I think it's all about burn multiple. What's another most important metric that you track? So that's why we built projection AI database. And you want to look at your ratio of sales and marketing R&D and GNA spend. And initially, since you're just trying to grow, you don't really manage that kind of balance and you focus too much on sales and marketing spend, or there's even companies that spend too much cash on GNA, which doesn't generate any cash, right? Because there's a lot of house cleaning to do from a governance perspective, from a document documentation perspective. I've seen several companies that we've taken a look at spend about 30% of their revenue on GNA. Right? If it's just one year, maybe that's solid, but if that's continuing, that's a nightmare. So focus on the balance of spending in sales and marketing, R&D and GNA. And for example, if you are a pure tech company catering towards engineers like Atlassian, of course, they spend a lot on R&D, right? I think Atlassian spends over like 50% on R&D. Right. Whereas Salesforce spends over 50% on sales and marketing because it's a sales company. So depending on your product, depending on the demographics or the segment that you're targeting, use your SNM R&D wisely and take a look at our database, Projection AI database, and you will have great examples of that. Those are public companies 
and you should not discount it because they're public. Those are like outstanding businesses that's become public and growing. So I think you should take a look at that ratio. I strongly recommend people check out the project about AI and we might, I need to remind myself to, to sign up today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so I think we've moved to the rapid fire round. I will ask a question and you can have a short answer. What's currently your favorite generative AI use case and tool? I am, to be honest, I'm being overwhelmed with all the tools and I'm trying to like use here and there. ChatGPT has been my go-to tool, right? I think the ratio is 50-50 between Google search and ChatGPT right now. It's increasing. Wow, that's pretty high. If you were invited to produce a Netflix show, what would be the title of the show and what would it be about in one line? Japan SaaS. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that's self-explanatory. Looking back now, what is one skill, either a soft or hard skill, that you believe you should have learned back in your time in school or early parts of your career? Coding. That's also a very, yeah, a self-explanatory one. If, if there's something that you could uh, in your job, uh, just by wishing for it, one aspect of your job would this be? Portfolio construction. Oh, okay. I would have thought it was fundraising, but okay, this is... <laughs> <laughs> That's also great. That's very interesting. What's your favorite go-to destination in Southeast Asia? Apart from Singapore. I grew up in Malaysia. Summer. Which, Which part? The Kuala Lumpur. Oh, wow. Okay. I see. That's great. And uh, I think this is more for myself also. What's your favorite activity to de-stress? Basketball. Oh, really? Okay. We should get a game in uh, Tokyo or Singapore. Mm -hmm. here. And a uh, favorite book? to recommend? I think it's zero to one, Peter Thiel. Yeah. Yeah. That's that, a great one. We that was a good one. And also, yeah. I think a billion dollar coach, Bill Campbell. A billion dollar coach. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a Japanese one to recommend? Several. I recommend the book written by Swimmy, Minami San, the original CEO. Um, okay. Okay. Talks you about question, questioning your judgment, like all the time. Why is that? Why is that? I think it's a very tactical book. No, oh, thank you. No, thank you so much. And this is uh, Sada San. So, this is a great pleasure talking to you. It's been a wealth of information, We've learned a lot, and we have been partners and look forward to deepening the partnership. I'm my go to person in Japan for not only SES, but all things Japan. So, thanks, thanks for your time. Thank you.